A lost preacher saved. Reason led me to the Bible. The Bible led me to Christ. With the prayer that it be of some encouragement and profit to you who hear it, I am going to record how I preached nine years before I was saved, how after the experiences as a worldling, a mystic, a neo-orthodoxer, and a modernist, I became a fundamentalist, turning away from all man-made schemes and coming as a helpless and ruined sinner to the cross of the Savior of the world. And here I must state that I once regarded the despised fundamentalist as bigots and ignoramuses. But from the day that their gospel saved me and did for me what none of the experiences referred to could do, I have had and do now have a deep and abiding affection for them. Had it not been for their courage in standing for the Christianity of the Bible, I would not be a Christian today. In reflecting on all this, I have something of the feeling of the psalmist. I believed, therefore have I spoken. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Psalm 116. I, Carl Woodbury of Indianapolis, Indiana, was born in Morganton, North Carolina on February the 5th, 1922. My father, a merchant, was a Yankee from New Hampshire. He was the grandson of a Unitarian minister and the son of a shoe manufacturer. My mother, an unreconstructed rebel of North Carolina, was the daughter of the Reverend Francis Freeman, an old-fashioned missionary Baptist minister who rode the mountain trails preaching the gospel and establishing Southern Baptist Convention churches. The atmosphere of my home stimulated my interest in men and affairs. My basic trouble as I was growing up was self-righteousness. It was a common thing for me to be referred to as a good boy by visiting relatives and ministers. They would say, Someday he is going to be a fine preacher like his grandfather Freeman. And of course, my dear mother wanted me to be a preacher. She often related how God preserved my life during an early and serious illness and had assured her that he had a purpose for my life, as I now see, incidentally, that he did. I grew up at my mother's knees hearing Bible stories. The church in which I grew up was socially and financially prominent, and some of the most gifted ministers of the Southern Baptist Convention preached from its pulpit. They preached the love of God, and they exalted the cross. But specific sins were not dealt with, and God's wrath and the eternal punishment of the wicked was seldom, if ever mentioned. I grew up accepting all that was written and said about the traditional Jesus. But I had no conviction that I was a guilty sinner and had to be born again. Prior to 1955, I hardly had a thought of being a sinner in need of salvation. During an annual protracted meeting, I told my mother that I wished to be baptized and unite with the church. I had been listening attentively to the minister's preaching. And one reason why I had was because he told many interesting stories. My mother asked me why I wished to be baptized and unite with the church. I said, because I love Jesus. But her countenance was trouble. Later I learned that it was because she had not seen any evidence in me of genuine conviction for sin. My mother called the minister and made an appointment with him for me. He met me in the annex of the church. He asked me if I believed that Jesus was the Son of God, if I believed that he had died for my sins, if I would confess him as my Savior, if I would follow him in baptism. I answered all these questions in the affirmative. But with all due respect to the minister, I remained unconverted after having done all that he told me to do. The truth was, my profession of faith was a false profession. I was not dishonest. I was deceived, not by the minister, but by the devil. Following my conversion, I attended the services in the church, including the Wednesday night prayer meeting, choir practice, and the Boy Scout meetings. And since our church made no issue with them, I also attended the theater, danced, and played cards. Why not? The town's first drive-in theater was built by one of our deacons. Another deacon operated a mountain beach which provided a dance hall, and the bridge club members were among the most faithful teachers and officers in the church. My position was that if a man didn't drink, gamble, or commit adultery, he was a Christian. I wasn't too good to do any of these. I was too proud. After courting around in the adjacent towns and communities, I fell in love with Ruth Lane. In my hometown, she is my wife. 
At the time, she, like myself, was worldly and lost. Brought up in the Methodist church, she later united with our church. She laughed if a preacher said anything about sin, but she was faithful in doing her part to carry out the church program. We were well matched. After a year of courtship, we were married in 1941. In 1943, I went into military service. I served with the Navy, attached to the 3rd Marine Division in the South Pacific. Of course, we had chaplains, but their ministry didn't impress me one way or the other. While in the Navy, I never crossed paths with a fundamental Bible preacher. The preaching of the chaplain, chaplains was about this, all roads lead to heaven, stay out of trouble, obey your superiors. The Second World War ended. The troop ship moved out from the harbor of Guam and headed for the good old USA. Time was cheap. Therefore, I accepted the invitation of a young Marine to attend a night prayer service after the movies. He tried to explain to me how I could and should live a sanctified life. He finally gave it up as a hopeless job. But one thing did happen. His talk revived my religious interest. I began to think about the ministry as I had often done. When I reached the States, I would have to make a definite decision about my life's work. I wanted to go into the clothing business with my father, but it seemed to me that my assurance of heaven depended upon my willingness to preach. One night after a Navy friend and I had gone to the movies, to the prayer service, and were finishing off with a card game, God seemed to say to me, Carl, I want you to preach. This impression came to me on several successive nights after the prayer service while I was playing cards. On the third night, my answer was, I shall be a Christian businessman, with the emphasis on the Christian. But the impression remained, I want you to preach. And then I began thinking about college and the seminary. Turning to my card partner, I asked, how much will the government pay a GI if he goes to school? Telling me how much it was, he wanted to know why I had asked the question. I said, I am thinking about studying for the ministry. Dropping the deck of cards, he exclaimed, Carl, you are not fit to preach. Back at home, I decided that I would preach and that I would go to Mars Hill College. My partner was right. I was not fit to preach. But I had several months on my hands before college opened in the fall. This meant that I had time to make some money and to get to work fitting myself into my new role as a preacher. Satan gave me a good hand. Some churches sponsored a preacher school. The teacher was a noted mystic. For years, a professor of philosophy at a Southern Baptist Convention college, he had resigned to go on a quest for the truth. This quest led him into all types of churches and groups. He ran the gamut of organized and unorganized confusion, confusing and being confused. Finally, he came up with a spectacular vision of what he calls the glorified Christ, a theological thesis that collaborates thought from Plato together with recent philosophers and mysticism of all ages to Christian science, Pentecostalism, and Baptist. Since no religion is wholly false, this teacher quoted scripture, and he constantly talked of Jesus. Since I was going to be a preacher, this preacher school was just what I was looking for. Almost everyone was enamored of the man's teaching. The school lasted two weeks. I laid aside everything and concentrated on getting his experience. I prayed his prayer. Jesus, come into my body, push out all evil, become flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, blood of my blood. Be my all in all. Amen. After keeping this up for several days, I had a mystical experience. Being mystical, it can't be explained. Although the experiences are real to the mystic, they are unscriptural and devilish. It sounds good, but it is another gospel which is not another, as Paul speaks of it in Galatians 1 and verse 6. At this time, a preacher gave me a book designed to instruct Christians on how to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. I knew nothing, of course, of the Bible's teaching of the Holy Spirit. Satan was providing for me. Lost religious people are like untrained dogs. They will chase anything that moves. I started my chase out of necessity. I had to preach. But now I was enjoying it. Experience followed upon experience. I was equipped. Satan had blinded me from birth, churched me, called me, and now he had energized me with his experiences of mysticism and baptism of the Spirit. I had announced that I was called to preach. I received invitations. I preached enthusiastically. What did I preach? I preached Jesus. I boasted about my experiences and how close to Jesus I was. All the time, I was lost. I know that all these experiences were of the devil. I know it because they destroyed the authority of the written scriptures. 
The written scriptures are the test, the sole rule of faith and practice. One day I had a vision. I believed that I saw the face of Jesus. I believed that I saw him on the cross. Liquid love flowed through my body. From that instant, I became a pacifist and a one-worlder. I was all for union of everything and everybody, of course, except fundamentalism. I hated fundamentalism. I didn't get this from the Bible. I got it from my mysticism, from my vision. True, I used the Bible when I preached, but only as a pig for my own thoughts. I fool people by using the Bible and talking about Jesus. Mysticism and asceticism are twins. I didn't neglect my body, but I did withdraw from many things good and bad. My separation was the separation of a Pharisee, not that of a true disciple of the Christ of the Bible. My holiness was different from that of most people. It was holier than, than, than thou. I had received a mystical union with Jesus, I thought. I had been baptized in the Spirit, I thought. I had seen Jesus face to face, I thought. The truth was that I had not even been saved. My wife was having a struggle. To begin with, she had no sympathy with my being a minister. Gods are the devils. Her mother told her frankly that God didn't call men like me to preach. But in spite of everything, my dear wife, realizing that I meant to go on, yielded. In desperation and at my urging, she prayed the mystic's model prayer and then tried to walk with me. In the fall of 1946, my wife, daughter, and I were settled in the hills of western North Carolina at Mars Hill College. It was there that I became a modernist. My mother had attended this school. It was known among Southern Baptists as one of the most conservative colleges in the convention. And even now, I believe that it is as sound as any of the convention's institutions, perhaps more so. Dr. R. L. Moore, a friend of my family for many years, had retired as president. A new day had begun. Modernists had infiltrated, and supposedly fundamental professors who had been on the faculty for many years began to speak blasphemy. A pronounced modernist was pastor of Mars Hill Town and College Baptist Church. He was a graduate of Wake Forest College, and Crozer Theological Seminary. He and I became warm friends. I went to him with all my questions. He answered all of them at the expense of all the basic doctrines of historic Christianity. A member of the faculty, a friend of the families of both my wife and I, spent several hours in my home helping me to deny the virgin birth. Another faculty member became enthralled with Dr. Albert Schweitzer, a liberal. I was president of the ministerial conference one year while I was at Mars Hill. I made an address at one of the meetings in which I delivered myself as follows. Abraham and Moses were in the chains of ignorance and heathenism. David and others to a less extent. The disciples of Jesus broke many of these chains. But we today in this enlightened age ought to stand on their shoulders and write new scripture and not be bound to any book of the past. The following Sunday... The Mars Hill pastor quoted me in his sermon with enthusiastic praise. A faculty member met me in the vestibule of the church on that Sunday and complimented me highly. There were two professors present the night that I delivered the blasphemous message. They both complimented me highly. The only objection one of them had to it concerned an error in pronunciation. Incidentally, I once asked this professor for whom I personally had a warm regard if the substitutionary death of Christ was necessary for the doctrine of the atonement. He replied, the entire life of Jesus was an atonement. Thank God I later learned that without shedding of blood is no remission. Hebrews 9.22 Evolution, of course, was taught in the science textbook. I studied it and believed it. Nothing was ever said against it. I was recommended to the Associational Missionary for a pastorate. As a result, I became supply pastor at Mendelssohn Seminary Baptist Church. I did not preach my modernistic beliefs. I knew the people would not receive it. I used the scriptures, but I never preached anything positively. I often used the New Revised Standard Version of the New Testament. The Old Testament had not come off the press. Of course, I do not use this perversion of the scriptures now. The people came to church hungry and they went away hungry. I gave them just enough to keep them coming back. There's an old saying, a blind hog will pick up an acorn now and then. I believed the hidden things of dishonesty 
walked in craftiness, handled the word of God deceitfully, and the gospel was hid to those who were lost. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. I was happy, I thought. My new life of mysticism, modernism, evolution, and modern enlightenment in general thrill me. When I arrived on the campus of Wake Forest College, I needed a little brushing up to feel at home there. Mysticism had destroyed the authority of the Bible. Modernism had explained away all the miracles. Word preceded me at Wake Forest that I was a progressive and was, a de- was deserting of cultivation. This meant that they didn't have to talk to me with reserve. Meantime, I knew that Wake Forest was modernistic. That's the reason I went there. I didn't go there to study the Bible. When I graduated, I had a double major in Greek and English and a double minor in philosophy and psychology and history. I shall always be grateful for the course in philosophy. It was a turning point. In my study, I discovered that all philosophers died, that new men rehashed their thoughts, adding and taking away, and then they died. And yet, after several thousand years of this process, man had been unable to know God through human reasoning. It made a profound impression on my mind. I began to read the Bible afresh. I learned that the Bible declared itself to be the Word of God and that it could not be destroyed. These truths began to impress themselves on my mind. It was at this point that I moved to the neo-Orthodox position, that is, that the Bible contains the Word of God. Meantime, I was a pacifist. I condemned the protection of democracy and individual life. I rejected all the scriptures that justified war or the death penalty. My God was a God of love, I would say. Things began to come to a head for me. I was carrying a full load of schoolwork, completing the structure of my home, operating a dry-cleaning route at night, preaching every Sunday, and fighting God and society. I almost collapsed. The doctor told me that my trouble was outside his field. But I didn't collapse. I pulled myself together and went on with my work. Wake Forest was steeped in modernism. One professor said in class that the teachings of Jesus could be understood by the smallest child until the first theologian, the Apostle Paul, confused them. And now he went on, one cannot understand them with all the dictionaries and commentaries in the world at hand. The college chaplain, who was the pastor of the Baptist church on the campus, was visiting the classroom that day and heard the statement. I later asked, some advice from the college chaplain concerning the modernism. He put his feet on his desk, lighted a cigarette, blew smoke rings, and said, Now the thing for you to do is settle down, study, and keep your mouth shut. One professor openly denied the Trinity in class. Another member of the faculty told me that he had a friend in New York, a Jewish rabbi who loved Jesus Christ as much as I or any other Christian. The same professor told me that I ought to join up with the fundamentalist. This, incidentally, was the best advice I got while at Wake Forest. Wake Forest apostasy and the course results and fruits of that apostasy are, of course, now known to newspaper readers, not only in North Carolina, but throughout the United States and many parts of the world. I saw much of it firsthand. One of the athletic coaches was a violent blasphemer. One summer, a dormitory was constructed for football players. The work went on seven days a week, even during church hours, within hearing distance of the church. Drinking and poker were, were common. Boys and girls were permitted to smoke in most of the classrooms. There was nearly always a card game going on in the college soda shop. While I was a student at Wake Forest, I was ordained to the ministry by the First Baptist Church of Morganton, North Carolina. When I was asked for the time and experience of my conversion... I frankly admitted that I had not had a definite experience of conversion. I was then asked, how do you know that you will go to heaven? I replied, I would be willing to go to hell with what I have. Five years later, when the Holy Spirit convicted me that I was going to hell, I changed my mind. But I was approved and ordained. I came to the end of my career at Wake Forest, a law center, ordained to the ministry, confused by mysticism, disgusted with with modernism, resting a little in New Orthodoxy, and waiting for a train to Chester, Pennsylvania, where I was to study in Crozer Theological Seminary. Now, Crozer Theological Seminary has recently merged with Colgate Rochester Seminary in Rochester, New York, which is an equally liberal and modernistic school. One of the Wake Forest faculty members, the Dean of Men, had recommended me to 
to, to the president of Crozer. I appreciated the fact that Dr. Blanton of Crozer invited me to his home and gave me a personal invitation to Crozer. He offered to send a truck for my household goods, and he also offered to take care of me in a very fine way financially when I got there, because it was a highly endowed school. But I declined his generous offer. I paid my own transportation and returned all scholarship checks. I was getting suspicious of modernism, and if I decided to leave it, I didn't want to owe it anything. I went to Crozer to discover if modernism had an element of truth in it. Crozer, of course, is an American Baptist institution. There, at, they at least deserve credit for not trying to conceal their modernism. In orientation, one of the professors said, You students think that you are liberal. You will discover that you are only a light pink. The New Testament professor, who was the chairman of the deacons of the First Baptist Church in Philadelphia, openly denied the deity of Christ. In the New Testament class, we had a Jewish dentist. The understanding of the students was that his wife, who was a Christian, had died and before her death had requested her husband to study in a Christian school. One day our professor said to this dentist, Now, Dr. So-and-so is a Hebrew. His religion is Judaism. I am a Christian. My religion is Christianity. I would not want to see Dr. So-and-so become a Christian. No one ought to ever change his religion. Another professor openly and vehemently denied that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and he tried to convince the class that Paul never believed that Christ was the Son of God. Another professor forbade any student to use the word Jesus in practice speeches. Sunday is enough for religion. I like a vacation, he said. The professor of ethics was lecturing on neorthodoxy. I was amazed at the flow of fundamental terms. At the close of the class period, I asked him, Do Bruner, Bart, and Niebuhr, and others of the neorthodox school mean literally their fundamental terminology? He said, No. I asked, Do you? He said, No, Carl. It is only a scaffold to hold your thoughts. Incidentally, this professor often cursed in class as he lectured. The truth struck me with great force. The neo-orthodoxy, which means the new orthodoxy, is not a new orthodoxy. It is a new cloak for the old deceptive modernism. Here I had another turning point. In theology, I wrote a paper on revelation. Revelation as related to mysticism, Catholicism, fundamentalism, modernism, and new orthodoxy. I was shocked to discover through the research I made for the paper that fundamentalism claims the only reasonable, dependable basis for revelation, that is, the Bible as the Word of God. At the time, I was student assistant to the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Camden, New Jersey. When one day I told the pastor that he was a Unitarian, he nodded assent. The faculty ridiculed the independent Baptist preachers in Chester, Pennsylvania. This interested me in them. I became acquainted with the Reverend Mr. Bronson of North Chester Baptist Church, and with the Reverend Merrill Winters of the Baptist Temple. I found them to be men who loved the Bible and preached it with inspiring results. In my confusion, I began to reason. If God is love, and if God says, Come, let us reason together, there must be one source of authority on theology to lead me out of this terrible mental and spiritual state. I came to the conclusion that the answer was that the Bible is God's word, every word of it. When I came to this conclusion... I found myself the last thing that I'd wanted to be, the last thing that I'd ever thought of being, a fundamentalist. I had always believed that fundamentalism was for emotional people, not for people who studied, thought, and analyzed. It certainly wasn't true in my case. The truth, the truth drove me to fundamentalism. Reason led me to the Bible. The Bible led me to Christ. After I came to accept the Bible, as the Word of God, in November 1951, I informed the authorities that I was leaving Crozer. My father telephoned me and said, Carl, please stay in school. I will send you all the money you need. I said, no, I am making plenty of money at the Lima Hamilton Corporation, Eddystone, Pennsylvania. It is not a question of money. I am through. In three years, I was saved, and in the following way. 
One of my hometown churches extended me a call to become its pastor. The invitation came by telegram. The church was in trouble and needed help. The members knew me and knew my character. When the time came for the special revival services, I sought for a fundamentalist preacher to help me. The Reverend Ed Miller of Hickory, North Carolina, was being persecuted for his stand for God's Word. I invited him to help us. It seemed to me that all he preached for two weeks was Romans 5, 8, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He kept hammering away on that. I couldn't get away from it. I began to search the Scriptures. I discovered that the truth of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for sinners runs like a scarlet thread from Genesis to Revelation. My mother came to my help. Through the years, she had given me many fundamental premillennial books and tracts. I had always thought that I was too smart to read them, but now I began to read them and to compare their teachings with the Scriptures. At about the same time, somebody, I have never known who, sent me a subscription to the Sword of the Lord. The books and tracts my mother had given me, and the sermons in the Sword of the Lord, and the study I was doing in the Bible gradually led me along the road that led to the cross. I tried to preach the gospel. Sometimes I succeeded reasonably well when I followed the outline of one who knew it. At other times, I couldn't keep near the truth. I tried at times to tell the congregation how I became a Christian, but usually wound up by saying, I have had so many experiences that I don't know just when I was saved. I was convinced of definite things by the Word of God. I tried to be intellectually honest with the Bible. I was convinced that there was a simple plan of salvation. I believed in the finished work of Christ on the cross, in man's justification solely through Christ, in the necessity of man's repentance, in the necessity of man's hearing the gospel, in the necessity of man believing the gospel. I believed there was but one gospel. I believed that all who heard the gospel could be saved if they would believe and accept it. I believed that the Bible taught eternal salvation. While I was the pastor of Clear Creek Baptist Church near Charlotte, North Carolina, I met Mrs. Addie Balkum Brooks, who lived in a nursing home in Waxhaw, North Carolina. She had suffered of arthritis since 1926. She had read her Bible through 30 times. She was a woman of powerful intercessory prayer. I asked Mrs. Brooks if she would take my case to God and pray until something happened. I told her, there is something wrong. I am terribly burdened. Perhaps I should go to the mission field. I don't know what the trouble is. She promised me that by God's grace she would be faithful to pray. Later she told me, after I was saved, that the Lord showed her through the Bible that I was trying to get to heaven without the blood of Christ being applied to my heart. Several months after I met Mrs. Brooks, I accepted the pastorate of Pitts Baptist Church near Concord, North Carolina. It was a mission work. I purposely accepted the church to try to do something good for God, to make a sacrifice. I was the first full-time pastor. I was going to lead the church to support the Southern Baptist Convention program. The associational missionary promised help. We took a religious census on Sunday afternoon. I invited the Reverend Matt Klein to preach for us on Sunday night. Mr. Klein lived in the Pitts community near Concord. He had been a Presbyterian elder in a Presbyterian church in the area, lost without God and without hope, and was gloriously saved at an old-fashioned camp meeting. Then God called him to preach, and he became a Baptist preacher. I knew that he was not in too good graces with the association because of his firm stand on the Bible, but I was tired. I wanted him to preach and get it over with. He preached on repentance. I became angry. I was suddenly conscious that I had never repented. I thought he was deliberately trying to embarrass me before the congregation. A barbed arrow was driven through my heart that night. For five weeks, I tried to pull it out. It wouldn't come out. All the Baptist churches in the community were simultaneously studying the book of Hebrews. I was asked to teach the book in two of the churches. I knew that the key to the book was faith. Therefore, I prayed and said, Jesus. You see, I never called him Lord until after I was saved. Jesus, please teach me what faith is. He did. He taught me what saving faith was. I studied diligently. The most terrible cloud came over me. I began driving the highways day and night praying. I went into churches, fell on my face, and screamed for hours at a time. It was time for the associational simultaneous revival. 
I decided that I would do the preaching in the church where I was pastor. I had read in the Bible where the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 164, Seven times a day do I praise thee. I asked the people to pray for the meeting seven times a day wherever they were. Many did. An extraordinary thing happened. By mistake, I announced the revival a week earlier than I was supposed to, which meant that the prayer services began earlier. As the people prayed seven times a day, I also prayed seven times a day. I lived beneath the cliffs of Sinai. There was no peace. There was continual thunder of God's wrath and condemnation. I began confessing my sins and begging God to forgive me. He didn't answer. You see, I was at Sinai, not Calvary. The Word of God began impressing itself on my mind with regard to Christ. I became convicted that I had never repented of my sins, had not been saved because I had not truly believed on the Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation. Such passages as these stirred me. Second John, verse 9, Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. You see, I had denied the virgin birth. And again in John chapter 5 and verse 46, the Lord Jesus said, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? You see, I had utterly rejected the Old Testament and mocked and scoffed Moses. Again in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world. When I read these last words, my heart was pricked. I clasped my hand over my heart and cried, Oh God, this is the first time in my life that I have ever been afraid. I could hardly walk to the pulpit to try to preach. I became afraid to go to sleep at night. I lost my appetite. Folks began questioning my wife as to what the trouble was. She in turn, of course, would question me. But I wouldn't even whisper that I was lost. One morning, I left my breakfast half eaten. My wife said, Carl, I have asked you again and again what is wrong with you, and you only say it's the problems of the pastorate. She said, I have no reason to distrust you, but I have turned every stone, and I'm going to turn the last stone this morning. You must be in love with another woman. My wife and I have always been very close and faithful to one another. I said, I cannot let you believe that. If you're laboring under that, I will tell you the truth. I am lost. I have never been saved. She was incensed. She was a wonderful Sunday school teacher and a leader in the Women's Missionary Union. But she too was lost. I fell on my knees in the kitchen. But she was so angry that I could get nowhere trying to pray in her presence. I had my Bible in my hand. I ran to the bedroom with it open to the 10th chapter of Romans. I fell down on the floor and said, Oh God, I don't understand it, but one thing I know... I'm the biggest sinner in the entire world today. My eyes dropped on that page open before me. I read a verse that I had never preached from in nine years of preaching. Romans 10 and 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. My mind went to Isaiah chapter 53. I turned to the chapter and read, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. There were no longer visions and feelings. By faith in the naked word of God, I believe that Jesus Christ had died for my sins, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day. In other words, I believe the gospel as defined by Paul in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I said, Lord, if you are satisfied with what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in my behalf, it's your bargain. I am satisfied too. I confess the Lord Jesus as my Lord and Savior. At that very moment, the burden of my sin and guilt rolled away. I stood up a saved man. I knew that I had been saved, that I had been born again. I ran out of the house. My wife said, where are you going? I said, I am going to tell Brother Mac that I have been saved. That's the man that preached on repentance that night. My heart for the first time in my life was singing about the amazing grace that had saved a sinner like me. Stanza by stanza, it sang it, all of it. The Word of God had led me to Christ. I had done what the Word of God told me to do to be saved. I was saved. I was saved on March the 23rd, 1955. My dear wife was saved three days later. 
Following my salvation, I was baptized by the Southside Baptist Church in Concord, North Carolina. Realizing that I had never been called to preach, I was getting ready to give up my pastorate and leave the ministry. It was at this time that I received a real scriptural call from the Lord to preach the gospel. I was recalled by the Pitts Baptist Church, and I was ordained to the ministry by the Pitts Baptist Church. I saw Mrs. Brooks one time after I was saved. She praised God. I went to see her a second time. The bed was empty. The frail, twisted body was gone. Mrs. Helms, who cared for her, told me that following my first visit, Mrs. Brooks had prayed all night begging God to save my soul. After I was converted, called to preach, and ordained, I remained with the Pitts Baptist Church for two years. I withdrew all support from the modernistic agencies of the convention. I began to designate gifts to special objects that were fundamental. The mission given was tripled. All indebtedness was paid off. The gospel was preached in the pulpit and from house to house. The countryside was flooded with gospel literature. I was thrilled with the power of the gospel. The convention opposed me, but I kept my eyes on the Lord. One soul fought modernism and went straight ahead. The battle was the Lord's. God gave the victory for two years. Then the Lord told me to leave the convention. This revelation came through the word of God. I became more and more conscious of the fact that even the mission program of the convention was seasoned with modernism, and of course it is post-millennial. I wanted to be the pastor of a church and support a mission program that was scriptural and effective. I came to realize that my zeal was only a tool for a modernistic postmillennial program. I decided to sever my entire life from modernism if it cost me my life. I left the Southern Baptist Convention. I became an independent Baptist preacher. To date, I have organized several independent Baptist churches and have been the pastor of them. I have traveled across America now for 12 years by faith as a full-time evangelist, preaching revival meetings, encouraging God's people to stand and having done all to stand. May I say to you today in closing, if you have never truly been born again, I pray that God will pierce your heart that God will speak through the veneer of your religious life and deeply convict you of your lost condition, your need of repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ye must be born again. Your church membership, your baptism, your zeal, your sincerity will not, st will not save you. You must repent of your sins toward God and trust fully and completely the Lord Jesus as your Savior. You must lean on Him and Him alone. Come not in your merits, but come only in the merits of the Lord Jesus, and be justified through the finished work of the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Turn to God in repentance. Flee from your little shallow religion, and be saved today. After you're saved, you need to be baptized, immersed by an independent Baptist church. You need to stand with God's people. Hold your membership in an independent Baptist church that stands for the Word of God, for the deity of Christ, for salvation by grace through faith, for the soon coming Savior. Stand, contend for the faith. Be counted for Him. May God help you to do it. If you have been saved by God's grace, I want to invite you to write me Carl Woodbury, Evangelist Carl Woodbury, 825 North Ritter, R-I-T-T-E-R, -T -T -E North Ritter Avenue, Indianapolis, Indiana, zip code 46219. This testimony is in print and can be purchased in quantity. This testimony can be obtained on cassette tape and on record. I invite you to write for information as to how you can order this and distribute it among your friends to win your friends and your neighbors and your lost loved ones to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Help me spread this testimony across the earth for the encouragement of God's people and to the salvation of souls of those who are outside Jesus Christ. May God help you to do it today.